Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Rosen Wartell, and I have the great privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute. And behalf, on behalf of all of my colleagues at Urban, the great pleasure of welcoming you uh, to this really uh, exciting afternoon. Uh, we could not be more thrilled to host this. I think most of you know what Urban is, but forgive me just a second to say that um, the Urban Institute is an organization that does social and economic policy research um, and it brings data and um, analytic rigor and modeling tools and program evaluation to some of the biggest challenges that our society faces. We were founded in 1968 after the riots in our cities and we, our purpose at the time was to deepen understanding of the hopes and obstacles that were facing the poor living in many of America's cities and to help policymakers understand whether the policies that they were implementing were working. Today our research portfolio ranges from the social safety net to health and tax policy, from the well-being of families and neighborhoods, trends in work, earnings, wealth building, building and much, much more. And if you visit urban.org these days, I think you will see that we understand that behind data and analysis and uh, snazzy data visualizations and much more, we understand that what we're talking about in all of that analysis and work is about the lives of real people. Today we're going to explore stories that urban researchers have studied for decades, policies that many of my colleagues have helped to inform, issues that many here today work on in their day-to-day -day lives still. We would uh, explore those stories today through the lives of residents of Yonkers because they were brought to life in a really compelling book by Lisa Belkin and they've now been brought to our screens and televisions and other devices across the nation through the extraordinary work of David Simon in the HBO series, Show Me a Hero. Let me briefly introduce our panelists now so that we can then uh, hear a little bit about the show and see an excerpt and then the panel will come back up and talk more about it and then I hope talk with all of you. First I'm going to introduce Secretary uh, of HUD, Housing and Urban Development, Julian Castro. Secretary Castro assumed his role at HUD in July of last year so it's now been a little over a year Mr. Secretary, he still probably that feels like the new kid. Um, but he has quickly established himself as someone who is focused on a performance-driven approach to expanding opportunity for all of our Americans. Not only does he bring to our discussion today the perspective of a senior administration official, part of the uh, um, government efforts to, to uh, strengthen opportunity, but he is a former mayor who has had to wrestle in his own city of San Antonio with all kinds of challenges in a new era, but still with similar issues. He was, as San Antonio mayor, a leader in urban development, a leader in education for young people of that city, and in particular, a leader in bringing together an understanding of how the different silos of policy in one place all come together to improve or get in the way of people making progress in their own lives. Um, David Simon probably needs no introduction to this room. In my house, he's known as the person most responsible for sleepless nights for my husband whose bedtime is 10 o'clock, looks over to me and says at 1.30 in the morning, yeah, we can watch one more episode, can't we, on a school night. Um, we, it, it, David Simon's work is the definition in the dictionary, I believe, of compelling. He is the executive producer and writer of Show Me a Hero. He has written and produced many critically acclaimed television series including Homicide, Life on the Street, The Wire, Treme, our, our most recent ones we all know. Uh, his projects, though, explore and make us all want to know more about poverty, corruption, the parts of our society that don't work. And yet, he makes us not want to turn our eyes away, but look and understand, because he tells a compelling story about we people. In doing so, he draws on his creative uh, in his creative work on his background as a beat reporter from the Baltimore Sun. 
We're also very excited to have my new friend, a longtime friend of Urban, James Perry. James is a community advocate and housing expert who spent 10 years as the CEO of the Greater New Orleans Fair Housing Action Center. Under his leadership, the center won more than half a billion dollars for victims of discrimination across Louisiana. Before working in New Orleans, James founded the Mississippi Gulf Coast Fair Housing Center, which was the first organization of its type in Mississippi. And finally, I'm gonna be joined in this discussion with Urban's own Marge Turner. Marge is a nationally recognized expert on urban policy and neighborhood issues. She's analyzed issues of residential location, racial and ethnic discrimination, and its contributions to neighborhood segregation and inequality. And she's studied the role of housing policies in promoting residential mobility and location choice. In a 2009 book written with her urban colleagues called Public Housing and the Legacy of Segregation, she explored many of the questions that we'll be talking about today. She also joins me in being uh, part of the uh, loyal group of HUD alumni of whom I see many in this room. And finally, I just wanna thank Michonne Boston who helped us uh, work together with David and HUD and everyone else to pull this event together. We're very grateful for her really terrific partnership in this. So we're gonna start with a 13 minute segment from the second hour of Show Me the Hero. We're gonna see the struggles that the community was facing and a glimpse of several of the families that were impacted by the court's decisions. And then we're gonna bring the panel up and we'll have time for questions. You should have found on your seats, index cards. Um, throughout the, today's event, I encourage you to write down thoughts and ideas and as we get into the panel, people will come through the room and collect those for you. And we are, we're looking forward to being able to then sort through and create a nice flow of conversation with the questions. Um, I also will encourage those of you who like to tweet to use the hashtag live at urban and hashtag show me a hero to the extent you can in part of this uh, discussion. So finally, we have one more really special guest for you all today. Clayton LaBeouf played the civil rights leader Benjamin Hooks in the series. He's performed off Broadway at top regional theaters, but most of us probably know him through his appearances in many other HBO productions, including Something the Lord Made, The Wire, The Corner, and uh, the role in which I first uh, was introduced to him as Captain Barnfather on the NBA, NBC series, Homicide Life on the Street. Perhaps most relevant today, though, is that Clayton grew up in Yonkers and, in fact, lived in the Schlumbaum Public Housing Projects. And so it's really a terrific honor for us to have you introduce the clip for us today. Thank you for being here, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be here uh, at the Monaco. I want to be, uh, make it clear that the Urban Institute and their mission to elevate the debate, to elevate the discussion, to elevate what we would say on the street, rapping to one another. <laughs> this is my first collaboration with the Urban Institute. It is a collaboration that I've dealt with, though, with another young lady, Mashan Boston, of the Mashan Boston Group. She has helped to drive this event that we're at here this afternoon. I want to thank her. We are working on a film preservation project as we speak. The young lady is a special woman here in the Washington, D.C. area. I want to thank her. Before we show the clip, Obviously, my work with David, I can speak, and I'd be glad to speak with anybody. As I move forward uh, in theater, television, and film, I will be speaking a lot about the work with Mr. David Simon. Uh, it's surreal for me to look out of my window as a child at the city hall clock that you see in the series. And as a young man looking out at that clock, I recognize constantly what time was. What is time? And I hear people talk about time being money, and I disagree, time is your heartbeat. And I learned that as a child, as I would stare at this clock, it was a friend of mine, but it, it caused me a lot of problems too because I had friends that do time, literally, living up in the projects. I took a different route. But I wanna share something with you before I get started. Mr. Bob Mayhawk is a man that I knew, a man that's also portrayed by a wonderful actor by the name of Clark Peters, he portrays Mr. Robert Mayhawk, 
who was the counselor for the people in the project. He gave me a book in 1986, okay? It was called Mayhawk's Law. It sounds like a good name for a television show. But in his book, he has a guiding principle and it says, everything is connected to everything else. Now that's simple, but it's profound, like most things. Everything is connected to everything else. And when you open up the first page of Lisa Belkin's book, the first thing you see, or the first thing I saw, current events. The book has a copyright date of 1980, but when you open the hardcover up, the first thing next to the price of the book, it says current events. Back to time. What is current? What is past? Is enslavement a long time ago? Hmm. No, it was yesterday, whether people want to believe it or not. Everything is connected to everything else. We're gonna move on with the panel and leave you with this word. If everything is connected to everything else, we have court orders and appeals going on back in the day with Lorraine Hansberry's Hansberry versus Lee in Chicago. Everything is connected to everything else. Right now as we speak in the nation's capital, isn't there appeals and court orders for a football team in this town? Everything is connected to everything else. Mr. David Simon's work as I appeared on Homicide, as I appeared in The Wire, these things are meaningful works of depth. And as a young man who was cast in The King and I in my Yonkers High School and turned down the role because it was too corny. <laughs> but I did do The Dutchman by Amiri Baraka. It was a little bit more to my taste. So you dream of roles of depth as a theater actor, as someone, some people. I dreamt of roles that had depth and meaning, and Mr. Simon has provided those roles for me, and I thank him. The last thing I'll leave you with, as my two minutes comes to a close, everything is related to everything else. We're navigating curves, ladies and gentlemen, as far as what they call race is concerned. I don't believe too much in dialogues on race. I believe in dialogues about achievement and accomplishment. You'll see what people look like when you tell people what, things, what they've done. Listen to this, and I'll close. I am not attracted to straight angles or the straight line. I'm not attracted to those. I'm attracted to hard and inflexible. They've been created by man. I'm attracted to free-flowing curves. I find in the mountains and the rivers and the waves of the ocean of my country. That's the architect, Oscar Niemeyer, who built the United Nations headquarters. There's an architect in this series named Oscar Newman. Let's build Let's talk. Let's elevate the debate. Thank you. Background and action. It was the most challenging schedule I've ever encountered. We have something like 380 speaking roles. The riots, the demonstrations. The drama happened here, and you just have to put the camera on it and tell it truthfully, and I think they do it well. This is a story about how politics is actually practiced in America. You can run a long way as a politician in this country on the twin currencies of fear and money. In Yonkers, those two things really tore the town up. If Yonkers officials do not approve 200 units of public housing, I will find the city of Yonkers in contempt. It's a story of integration in a neighborhood of people who were not willing to do so. There was a need for more affordable housing. Yonkers had, for generations, put it in one very tiny area of the city to keep the city hyper-segregated. The judge said 200 units of low-income housing were to be built in the predominantly white, affluent part of town. It set off a bomb. Oh, no, oh, no. Nick was basically thrown to the dogs by his higher-up, saying, we're going to run you for mayor. They were imagining they were going to sacrifice him. He knocked off the six-time incumbent by saying, look, the difference between him and me is I voted to appeal the housing. He voted not to appeal. As soon as he got in, he found out that there was no grounds for appeal. You promised us an appeal. You have succeeded in raping the voters of this city. He was going to be a great mayor and have all these wonderful things that he was going to do. And then Judge Sand comes down and says, you know, this housing has to be built. And everything changed. People were very upset about the idea that their property values would be somehow compromised by public housing. 200 of these damn townhouses are within walking distance of my house, and I don't want it. She's part of this very strident group that opposes it, and she doesn't want this element down her street. These were people who felt that they were fighting for their community, and they really 
immediately felt that they were right and they were justified. Dwight Yonkers thought, this decision's got to be wrong. And they looked at Nick, and then he had to tell them the truth. There is no fight. We're a nation of laws, and we've lost. How come the only people talking about this damn housing thing are white? We also follow the lives of four women who are public housing residents. They were some of the bravest women I know. If you could move, would you? My home is my home. Everybody wasn't trying to integrate. Good, bad, indifferent, everybody wasn't trying. They don't want to live with us, and why should we want to live with them? It just shows how much fear there is on both sides. Fear of losing what you know to what you don't know. One of the most exciting things about this miniseries, it shows you justice at work. The federal case it was only settled in 2007. This is recent history. F. Scott Fitzgerald said, show me a hero and I'll write you a tragedy. It's just a very human story about this young guy trying to find his way through this mess. It's one of the most emotionally demanding roles I've played. So first of all, uh, David, congratulations. Well, thank you. It's, it's uh, extraordinarily uh, compelling television, and if there's anyone in the room who has not watched all six episodes, my highest recommendation is that you spend the hours between 11 and 2 a.m. like I have uh, <laughs> a couple of nights over the last month uh, watching it, because it's really extraordinary. Um, but this is not your uh, typical Hollywood hero story. What made you want to bring these people's stories to life? of all the different stories you could choose from? Um, the, I mean, we optioned the book. I have a feeling it was me. I think we need a little less volume on the mics. Um, we optioned the book 14 years ago, 15 years ago. And, uh, we take his off and give him my mic, and I can share. You know what? I, 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 can everybody hear me? I'll just talk up. Because this thing feels lethal. What? Turn it off. Oh, that, now you're asking me to manipulate technology. <laughs> it's on. It's on? Okay. Good. Uh, we optioned the book 14 years ago. Um, and it was supposed to be the next miniseries. We were doing series, miniseries, series. It was supposed to be the next one after The Corner, which went on in uh, 2000. 2000. Um, and it got bumped for uh, Show Me a Hero, which had a news peg of the, of the Iraq War. And it got bumped for. Uh, Not Show Me a uh, Hero. I'm sorry. It got show for Generation Q. And it got bumped for Treme, right. which had the news peg of Katrina. Good thing about American racial dysfunction is it's always going to be around. It, you know, it just is, just wait on it and and it'll come around again. And that's literally what happened. It, the The story of Nick Wasisco and his his uh, mayoralty in Yonkers and what happened to him um, is pretty Shakespearean. And uh, he's not a perfect hero in any sense. In fact, that the real heroes of this piece are strangely enough uh, bureaucrats and some of the residents, and even some of the people who were opposed to the housing who later grew. Uh, uh, but, but Nick's, Nick's arc gives you something that you can latch onto and make, make a very wonky story human. So we knew it was there. It was just a matter of getting around to it, really. So Mr. Secretary, um, can you step back and help us uh, sort of put our heads back into I did not. Sorry. Okay, sorry guys. No, I'm still on. Can you hear me? All right. Um, so give us a little bit of a sense of where we were in the 1980s. This case obviously stretched for many years before. Uh, the show starts and, and stretched for years after. Um, we're kind of, we're checking into the middle of this story. Um, but can you uh, tell us a little bit more about the broader setting of what was happening in Yonkers uh, before the show starts and sort of what led the court to find that there was a deprivation of rights in the first place that made them issue orders to force the, we see here just the uh, first location of uh, 200 units um, 
that was going to uh, be of public housing, and then the next step was going to be another 800 units of other affordable housing. But even this first step took a decade. Yeah, and first of all, thank you very much uh, to you and to Urban for having us, and uh, my congratulations to David and his team for great work. Um, so this picks up, I believe, in 1987. Uh, the lawsuit had been filed in 1980. And it emanated out of the fact that uh, Yonkers had, I think. They seem to be slow to come up, but they're coming up, so. Can y'all hear? Yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, the Yonkers had squeezed um, almost all of its public housing, 7,000 units, into one square mile in West Yonkers. And that had drawn the attention of many folks, but uh, a lawsuit from the NAACP. Uh, and at this point in the movie, or at this point in the story, uh, when the movie picks up, uh, there had been a, a consent decree ordered, and they were failing to live up to the consent decree to locate 200 public housing units uh, in essentially a white part of the community. Uh, in other words, to start spreading out their affordable and public housing, and they were refusing to do that. Um, of course, this comes against the backdrop of uh, a history of essentially government-sponsored segregation that reached from local governments to state governments to the federal government. Uh, at FHA, for instance, there was a time when FHA essentially uh, rubber-stamped redlining um, on local governments. Decisions like the ones that were made in Yonkers were actually fairly common. Uh, and of course, in the private sector, you had a legacy of outright discrimination against people of color in the housing market. So that's, that's sort of the, the context of it when we pick this up in 1987. So we're going to come back later to talk more about the current day. But just give us um, a quick start to think about, you know, this doesn't feel that different than the things that are crossing your desk on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and uh, so just a, a quick thought about the government's role and in today's month. Do we still have a responsibility be trying to um, uh, tackle the issues of residential segregation. Do you feel like you have a little better tools today? Uh, the, yes and yes. Uh, we, we not only have a responsibility, I think a moral responsibility, we have a legal responsibility to do that under the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Um, and under the Fair Housing Act, the Secretary has a responsibility to affirmatively further fair housing. And so do jurisdictions that receive money from, from HUD. Uh, so, yes, there is that responsibility. Yes, we do see that. Uh, just at the end of, of last week on Friday, uh, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals uh, ruled in a case that is still going on with the county of Westchester. Uh, we feel like these days that the tools we have are both stronger and have been recently affirmed. I say stronger because over the summer we released the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Rule which essentially sharpens up both the tools and resources that we're giving to communities to help them understand the fair housing landscape in their localities and understand how they can do something about it to improve it uh, and, and strengthen uh, because there's, I think, a stronger resolve on our part at HUD these days and in the Obama administration to work with communities, to collaborate um, as vigorously as we can, but not to be afraid to enforce when we need to. Um, and the Supreme Court also affirmed our ability to use disparate impact uh, in the context of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. So it has been a very good year for fair housing, if it's safe to say. So James, you've been using the Fair Housing Act and other constitutional remedies uh, over the last uh, 20 years now. Um, what's changed since 1980? and? Uh, what hasn't? You know, that's one of the most interesting things about the, the show is, um, you know, I, I felt like it tracked the last 10 years of my life. Um, it, um, it, the, uh, one of the interesting cases that I worked on in New Orleans was uh, just outside of New Orleans in St. Bernard Parish. Um, it was a case uh, in which a, uh, a community uh, shortly after Hurricane Katrina passed a, a law called the Blood Relative Ordinance. And, and that ordinance provided that uh, you could not rent a single family home that you owned to someone who you were not related to by blood, right? So you had to be related to the person that you were gonna rent your home to. 
and this was right after Hurricane Katrina, I couldn't figure out for my life why they wanted to restrict uh, the opportunities to housing when so many home units had been destroyed. And so it, it became really clear that they were trying to keep people of color out of the parish after Hurricane Katrina. And so we uh, shortly afterwards filed suit against St. Bernard Parish, and we, we got a consent decree uh, within about nine months. And, uh, and so only, uh, only uh, two months after that consent decree, a developer tries to build affordable housing and is denied. And so they ask us to help them by using the consent decree. And so that turns into 10 years of litigation to get uh, just under uh, 200 units built in St. Bernard Parish in uh, a, a majority uh, white community. And so it, it, it's very similar to what happens here. And ultimately, uh, the, the person who, who proposed that uh, ordinance uh, runs on, on this, uh, uh, for mayor, under, under this, um, this whole theory that he will make sure that these affordable housing units uh, for low-income residents won't be built. And so then he gets in, and then the judge finds him and finds the parish. And, and they say, and, you know, says that it must be built. So finally he agrees to allow it to be built and, and on and on and on. And so, you know, it ends up being settled for several millions of dollars and the units are built. And, and so Secretary Castro, your, your predecessor, uh, came and visited those units probably in 2012 or, or so. And, and so, but it's almost exactly the same. So, so I, I was looking at, at the show and trying to figure out, well, what is different? Because so much of it tracked exactly what happened in, in, uh, in St. Bernard Parish right after Hurricane Katrina, and it was so similar to what was happening in, in Westchester. And the one thing that, was, that, that I did realize that was different actually wasn't better. The, the one thing that seems to me to be different is that um, in my experiences now, when I go into um, a, a city council chamber, uh, instead of it being an all-white city council chamber, it's a mixed-race city council chamber. And, and so there will be some African American or Latino members of that city council. Uh, and, and so, but the problem is that, uh, at least my experience has been, that oftentimes uh, those people of color who are on those, uh, those councils don't have any incentive to push for integration either. Because uh, if, if they start to see their council districts change too much, then they lose their power seat, right? They, they no longer have the ability to, to get all the votes that they need to be elected if, they, if their community becomes too integrated. And so they're worried. Uh, and so, so oftentimes they actually, um, you know, publicly they're supportive, but uh, behind closed doors they're not that supportive of, of uh, efforts to integrate communities. And, and that's the, the, thing, the only thing that I see that is that different from, from what was going on in the 80s. So I'm just going to uh, interrupt on that point for one second and ask, I was just looking at a news story about a similar case that's going on in Anne Arundel County right now, an effort to try to encourage the location of a small number of mm -hmm. affordable housing units. And what was most striking was quotes from uh, a local elected official that could have been straight out of uh, <laughs> Show Me a Hero. And the language, um, for those who haven't seen it yet, uh, later on uh, the mayor makes a very astute set of comments about uh, the residents, ab about the elected officials and the op community opponents using non, using racially mm. coded words, but never mentioning race. And in particular, he talks about, th th he, he calls out language where people say, it's not about race. What I care about is whether or not those people have earned the right to live in my neighborhood. Have they, um, have they, those people, uh, uh, saved up the money, worked as hard as I have, and the, since they haven't, they can't live here. And they very intentionally don't talk about, the, they, they claim they're not racist because of it. And this exact same language. Social engineering. That's the one that, that's the encoded, encrusted, libertarian phrase that, that, that argues against any attempt to mitigate generations of government-sponsored segregation. All, everything that happened to the point of people being asked to share in a present tense moment, uh, that's to be ignored. That we, 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 need no, we, need, we need no term for that. There's no vocabulary that needs to be discussed. From the moment that a judge says, look, you spent all your money, y y your government did this, it was a plan to have a hyper-segregated society, to keep your poor isolated as much as we conceivably could, you took the money, you did this willfully, and now there's a remedy. And at the point of that remedy, phrases like social engineering come up, like, oh, this judge is just trying social engineering. What, 
what the hell did you think the last 40 years? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> the, the, the arrogance of, of the libertarian ideal that says, I got here now and I want absolute freedom without responsibility, without any civic responsibility or any citizenship required of me. I, I want what I have now and I don't, if anyone didn't get it up to this point, screw them. And, and you, that's the you don't hear any echoes of that in current <laughs> discussions about your actions. Well, no, of course you do, of course <laughs> you do. Um, uh, I, you know, David is right. You see that argument and that label thrown about. Uh, we started to hear it as the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule was mm -hmm. coming out. Uh, I'm sure as it's implemented, we're going to continue to hear that. And I think you put it very well. Like, there's a history to all of this. It didn't just appear in a vacuum. You know, these communities and, and, and the racial composition, the ethnic composition, uh, the economic composition of them didn't just come about. They came about because of a set of policies in the public sector and actions in the private sector that fundamentally in time were undergirded by discrimination, by racial animus. So Marge, um, you spent a good bit of your time helping to tell those stories of the historical action and their consequences. What role did research play uh, in, the in the court cases in Yonkers and in the sort of longer history we have of trying to push uh, for racial integration? I really liked the role of Oscar Newman, uh, <laughs> um, the researcher who um, I really admired because it, it showed him drawing on uh, the research he had done to argue very explicitly for smaller developments uh, with architecture that blended into the neighborhood around them and with uh, the yards and um, uh, uh, ent private entrances that created what he called defensible space. Um, and he was uh, brave enough uh, to really speak directly to the judge and to the housing authority, this is the way you should build these units, even though it's gonna be more expensive, even though it means finding more sites. Uh, and I think this is something researchers really have to strive to do, uh, to pull from the knowledge that we've got uh, and make recommendations that are actionable for policymakers and practitioners, even though we know We've always got another question. We're always digging deeper. We're always trying to learn more and refine what we know. I think we've actually learned a ton on these issues since the 1980s uh, that is helping uh, the policy makers and practitioners working on these issues now. Um, the latest findings from Raj Chetty that have gotten a huge amount of public attention really put a capstone on a long uh, body of research that says that where you live makes a huge difference. Uh, that place matters, and it doesn't just matter for your sort of day-to-day -day well-being, it matters for the long-term life chances of kids. Um, we've also learned um, that just as we saw in the series and in the history of Yonkers since, uh, building affordable housing units in a white neighborhood, in a more affluent neighborhood, it doesn't bring down property values, uh, and it doesn't bring crime. As long as the uh, properties are well managed uh, and they're scaled appropriately, uh, they can be an asset to the neighborhood, not a problem for the neighborhood. So David, let's step back for a second and uh, go back to the people and talk a little bit more about uh, Nick Wasisco. Um, yes. For those who haven't seen the movie, uh, you could get a preview there uh, that he is first elected uh, by opposing the former mayor on this issue and then embraces the affordable housing plan and his f political fortunes suffer as a result greatly, as do his personal ones eventually. Um, what, what were you, on, on two levels, what kind of story were you trying to tell, both about an individual and um, his character, as well as about uh, the value of um, fair housing policy generally to the mayor? Before I go into that, I just want to reply. Um, Next to the Valentine Street site in Yonkers, where, um, where, uh, where we filmed, we used the actual townhomes uh, in the later episodes to depict the townhomes. Uh, because they're still there, they're still occupied, they're still entirely functional, exactly as you said. Um, where we needed, a, uh, we needed a construction site of houses under construction, um, right next to Valentine, right next to the actual townhomes, they were putting up I think four or five uh, $650,000 private homes. Um, which, and we used those as our, we faked those for the construction site <laughs> of our townhomes when the townhomes were being built. 
But think about that for a moment. If, if, if these townhomes had impaired the property values, in the, the, those, the, the, the vacant lot next to it would not be, you know, yeah. I mean, it was, it was really a telling moment that we, we stole our shots from an actual private developer who was putting <laughs> up, you know, big houses next to it. Um, Nick Wasisco was a, uh, uh, a backbench councilman, very young. He, at the time he was elected, he was the youngest mayor of a, of a city over 100,000 in, Amer in America. Um, so sort of officially a rising star of some sort. Um, he got in by maneuvering to the right of the existing mayor, who was no great champion of, of public housing himself. In fact, his, you know, I mean, one of the things that the Justice Department and the NAACP proved was all they had to do was go back to the minutes of the Housing Authority, and, and they literally were saying, "Don't build it here. We don't want black people in this ward." You know, I mean, they literally said it. It was, it was, it was unrepentant. And the mayor was part. The uh, Martinelli had been part of those discussions, but Martinelli had reached a point of realizing they had not a legal leg to stand on. They had to build the houses, so let's not waste any more money on the lawyers. And that was his political undoing because. Uh, Nick r ran to the right of him saying, uh, I voted to appeal to the, to the federal uh, appeal circuit. Uh, the mayor did not uh, vote for me. And he gets in before his inauguration. Um, I mean, he, before he's even, they even have the inauguration, the lawyers call and say the, the appeal's been denied. You've got to build the housing. There's no grounds to go to the Supreme Court. And he thinks, I think rather naively, well, I know I ran on appealing, but now we've lost the appeal, so I'll just tell the people that, and we're good to go. <laughs> um, so this is not a, there's no, there's no classic hero in this. There's, there's a guy who is a very reactive, very um, surface level local politician, which is kind of how I, you know, I covered a lot of them. They, he, he's, he was no better or worse than most. Um, he grew under pressure. Uh, and he came to see the housing as his legacy after the fact, and belatedly, but he did at the moment the chips were down, and I think you saw one of the votes where he was alone, mm -hmm. uh, where even his allies were abstaining. So, I mean, to give him credit, uh, he went through the maelstrom and, and he grew up a little bit uh, and, and started, he ended um, in, a in a different place. So, Mr. Secretary, you have perhaps not faced quite as uh, angry a mob at that di at very close distance. That I thought you were going to say, as these folks here. <laughs> <laughs> this is a friendly crowd. No, this is Give a pretty a friendly crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Give it um, time. But, uh, but you certainly had to make very hard and unpopular choices sitting in the mayor's seat. Can, as you watch the show, t talk to me a little bit about how you observed Nick's experiences. Uh, in different ways, as somebody who has been in local politics, uh, first of all, there's nothing like local politics. For those of y'all who have dealt in it or been in it, um, sitting where I do now with, as the Secretary of HUD, sometimes I miss the give and take uh, of people yelling at you, <laughs> insulting you, telling you and the council how bad you are, how much you don't know, and they're only like 15 feet away. You know? <laughs> you're, you're so pampered, you're so removed from all of it. It's not fun at all in that sense. <laughs> um, I remember uh, when I was a cal I got elected when I was 26 to city council, and I must I must have been about 27 or yeah about 27, and we were considering annexing an area that would have gone into my district, uh, and this area was right outside the city, uh, of middle and upper middle class homes, uh, and they did not want to be in the city, and. You know, this is a little bit of a different context, but you hear a lot of the same arguments, that they moved out there for a reason, and you know, the crime in the city, and you know, that, that things are great the way they are, and um, you know, San Antonio is a 63% Hispanic city, and yet the areas around it you know, are, are significantly less diverse. Uh, and probably the most tense situation that I ever had was standing on the front lawn in this subdivision that was slated for annexation. Uh, and this guy was about four feet away from me. Like, literally, if they had let him, he probably would have pounced on me. You know, no security, no anything. <laughs> it was me and one other council member. Uh, and you could just feel the, the intensity and the irrationality, really, of folks about these things. Um, 
And so what I think is that it, I thought that this depicted very well the way that some elected officials play to the crowd. You know, they know what is going to be very popular and they use that. That was Spallone, right? And then he, I think he ousts Wasisco. Right? Uh, he, he, he beats Wasisco. Yeah. It was two-year election, so he right came right on, on this. Yeah. That's very realistic. I mean, that's two you years know, not a surprise. <laughs> um, also, though, in some ways, especially in, in a single-member districted system, it brings up larger questions of democracy because some people do see democracy as you're supposed to just vote and be a mouthpiece for the way that the majority of the people that you represent think, right? There is some merit to that argument, but these issues often, you know, sort of brought that to bear. When do you do that and when, you know, it, it, though it's, it's always appropriate to, because you are the one that is elected there to use your judgment in this this also Republican form of government, I use that with a small r, not a big <laughs> one, um, to do what is right also. Um, so. Well, March, you were in the, at HUD in the 1990s, or we were there together when the Moving to Opportunity demonstration showed that these issues have life not only in the 1980s and currently, but there was a period in the period 90s too. And, these same issues came back. Um, and so you've been watching these issues unfold in cities around the country for all of your career. Um, just observations about uh, how elected officials try to live up to our principles and, 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 and what we can learn from those experiences? So I, there were many points in the series, and we saw a couple of them there, uh, that, that took me back very vividly to a long, hot evening uh, that I spent on a, uh, on a stage in a high school auditorium full of very angry people. Uh, uh, I was shout, you know, as a researcher, you don't often find yourself in venues where people are shouting you down. <laughs> um, and I remember thinking, there are techniques to handle this. <laughs> <laughs> and I do not know what they are. <laughs> um, it was a crowd full of people who did not want a single public housing family uh, to move from the city of Baltimore to their this community. Baltimore County. Yep. It was, yeah, Dundas, Maryland. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I heard the same kind of care in not being explicitly racist, but using coded language. So one of the many things that was shouted at me that evening was, uh, that these were people um, who just sat around watching Oprah all day and didn't know how to wash. It's those people, we don't want them in our neighborhood. Um, but um, in Baltimore uh, and in four other big segregated metropolitan areas around the country, uh, the Moving to Opportunity demonstration was implemented, uh, partly because of the courage, I think, of uh, then Secretary Henry Cisneros, uh, but also because uh, in many of those communities um, and in Baltimore, uh, organizers reached out uh, to well-meaning, welcoming, thoughtful people in the receiving communities, because they're there, uh, reached out to them and build uh, a web of support that breaks up that anger and fear from the receiving communities. And I think uh, it happened late in the story of Yonkers, uh, but it did happen that when well. people in the receiving community begin to meet human beings, uh, and welcome them into their community, we actually can overcome uh, this legacy of past social engineering. Do you want to talk about Mary? Uh, I was going to say that uh, uh, Clayton's friend, um, Bob Mayhawk, that was his role. It was his role was to crack the, uh, the, the white community in a way that um, ostensibly it was draped around an orientation program for the residents, which it was, I guess. There was a certain amount of... Uh, orientation to these families that would be moving into the new townhouses and into these white neighborhoods. But really, they were teaching a lot of the, uh, some of the even the most more adversarial people, uh, the, the white residents. Um, the, le the object lesson was actually going, it was very subversive, it was going the other way, which is, hi, we're going we're gonna to have you meet some of these families. And that was, that was all it took for some people. And, and the character played by Catherine Keener, Mary Dorman, who I got to meet before she passed away, mm -hmm. If you, when, when you met Mary later in life, she became one of the great champions of the townhouses, mm -hmm. and, 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 and she grew. 
And when you read her, her quotes from those early meetings and the stuff that she had said to reporters and, her, and how furious she was, she would say, she told Lisa Belkin, oh, I didn't say that. And Lisa would have to read her the minutes <laughs> of the meeting. She said, oh my God, I said that. And, and the, the, the key moment for her, which was very telling, was a, a revelation. She went to this protest, and they were basically protesting, and, and she could see that the, the bulldozers were clearing the land. And at that moment, she realized, it's coming. We've lost. This is now, you know, I don't know what I'm doing here anymore if we've lost. And oh my God, there's going to be people living here a block and a half away from where I live. And I'm going to be their neighbor. And they're going to think about all the things I said. And how will I be a neighbor if, like, all of a sudden they became real to her. They were not just an abstraction. These were real people who were going to be. And that was it for Mary. That, that broke her. You know, that meeting a couple of the people who were going to be in those houses, just she went the other way aggressively. That was the most subversive thing that Mayhawk achieved, and it was brilliant. It was just simple and brilliant. So James, when you're in a courtroom trying to invoke the Constitution or the Fair Housing Act for, on behalf of particular people, um, how do you think about sort of what, what, what actually changes hearts and minds, what makes a difference on the ground? Yeah, and, and just to be, to be clear, I think that, that litigation is a small part of this, uh, this effort. I think that uh, more than anything, it's a, it's a marketing effort. And, uh, and, and I think that, uh, that, that Mary is, is the person that we're trying to reach and the most difficult person. And, and I think uh, she represents uh, one of the most difficult questions uh, around the question or, or the goal of integration for, our, our, for these United States. And, and, that, and so, you know, all the time I, I read studies about um, the advantages uh, of integration and of diverse communities. And, 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 and those studies always talk about the, the benefits for uh, people of color. And, um, but, but oftentimes they propose integration and diversity as a benefit to, to white people uh, in altruistic terms. And what I, what I suggest is that it, um, a lot of times that's just not enough to convince people to support integration. Um, because they, they think that too much is at risk. Uh, be, because they're operating on stereotypes and they think that, that everything that they've invested could be lost uh, if you're wrong. Right? And, and so, you know, what happens with Mary is what we're trying to accomplish. And, and, and so, the, the, as, as I watched her, her character change, the, the problem uh, for me was um, the amount of resources that it took to change her. All right? and, and, so, and so, what I'm thinking the entire time is, well, you know, you know how much money did that cost, and, and how do I scale that? Uh, and you know how do I go to Secretary Castro and apply for a grant or for funding to, to scale that <laughs> for New Orleans, for Louisiana, for the United States? Uh, and and that, that's the challenge. So, Mr. Secretary, one of the debates that has raged alongside the discussion we've been just having for the last 30 years is about whether or not you can move into the communities where low-income families predominantly minority families live, and bring to those communities the assets that make for economic opportunity, for healthy social culture, um, whether that's bring employment into the community, bring social services into the community, access to transportation, or whether, like was tried in the MTO experiment, or in the moving the units uh, because of Oscar Newman's insight uh, into distributed neighborhoods around the city, um, you need to move people to places where that infrastructure for opportunity exists. And the Raj Chetty research Marge mentioned has sort of sharpened our thinking again about the fact that there are places where economic opportunity is much richer than it is in others. Um, uh, so how are we thinking today about those trade-offs and about whether we can make Schlobaum a place of opportunity or whether we have to move everyone into the other neighborhoods in Yonkers? equivalent places today. Yeah, you really hit the nail on the head of, of what is one of the fiercest debates out there in terms of what the best approach is. And the Raj Chetty research, no doubt, earlier this year was a very powerful reminder of how significant uh, it can be for families to get to move to higher opportunity areas. And the fact is, you know, for all many folks who have been following this over the last couple of decades, the story of our spending uh, on affordable housing is it, it's become more voucher-based over time. And, and so there is a strong commitment at HUD to that, 
but we're not going to give up. You also can't give up on meeting people where they're at. And that has been the focus of our place-based work, of trying to work with communities to empower them uh, to holistically lift up the economic uh, and quality of life factors of their neighborhood. So this is the idea behind promised neighborhoods, behind choice neighborhoods, strong cities, strong communities, a number of, of initiatives within HUD and other departments working with local communities. I just don't think that you can do just one of those, that you have to do both of those. Um, even if we accepted 100% that the best, for instance, the best thing to do would be to move people immediately to higher opportunity <coughs> neighborhoods, what about the people that don't want to move? You know, what about the people that, that that's where they grew up? That's the place they love. They feel connected. They've been there for generations. Um, I think you need to give folks who want that opportunity to move the chance to do that and use fair housing laws assertively and aggressively when you need to to make sure that it's not just other lower opportunity areas where they can move to, but they can move to those suburbs. They can move to, to higher opportunity areas within a city but then not forget about those distressed areas as well. You can't abandon them. And for the folks who want to remain there, we have to do our level best to improve those communities working with them as well. So James, we were just uh, in your hometown of New Orleans celebrating, is maybe not the right word, but marking the occasion of the 10th anniversary of Katrina. Um, and this debate is raging front and center in the neighborhoods where you hear people all the time saying, why are you telling me I need to move? Why can't the resources come to me here in the Lower Ninth Ward? Can you just talk a little bit about it from, from your hometown's perspective? It's a, it's a very difficult question. Um, and uh, you know, in the, in the days after Katrina, uh, there was no question because people were forced to leave their neighborhoods and forced to communities of opportunity. Uh, and so people found themselves all over the nation, oftentimes in a, in a community of opportunity. And um, you know, it, it was interesting because b before they left New Orleans, their biggest gripe was that the schools were terrible, there was a lot of crime, and um, you know, th there weren't job opportunities. But once they found themselves in a neighborhood of opportunity, their biggest gripe was that they couldn't find any more red beans. But, <laughs> but all the other issues were immediately solved, right? And, um, but so, but 10 years later, uh, the folks who, who, who are who've stuck with New Orleans um, are still dealing with the same questions. And, and, and some are, um, uh, are, are wrestling with uh, moving out of struggling neighborhoods like the Lower Ninth Ward, where um, I'm sorry to say that if, if you visit today, it doesn't look very different from the days that looked shortly after Hurricane Katrina. You know, it's still mostly a vacant field. Um, and um, so people who live there now say, well, you know, should I? continue to stay here in this vacant field where my house is, is the only house here and there are you know, one or two schools and uh, you know, only one grocery store? Or should I move to a community where there's opportunity? It's, it's, it's a very difficult issue. The, um, the, the neighborhood just adjacent to the neighborhood where, where I lived until um, about a year ago, um, the, um, the average uh, lifespan was uh, uh, people lived until they were about 55 years old. Uh, and uh, but you could move across town to uh, the Lakeview neighborhood where people uh, lived on average to be uh, to, into their late 70s. And uh, if you could afford it, it'd be a great place to, to live. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an unresolved issue. I, I do agree with Secretary Castro, though. I think it's both and. Uh, you, you make both options available, uh, and, and the, 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 the question becomes, can you afford it? One of, I, I read a um, recent article about a natural experiment that occurred because of the Katrina flood where many returning prisoners were unable to move to the neighborhoods that they otherwise would have returned to, the very poor neighborhoods in the Lower Ninth Ward. And a n large number of them ended up being, re uh, through intentional programs, located into, uh, in Houston, other cities, and that the recidivism rate was lower for those who didn't return to their home community as those who did. Um, Marge, you've been studying this question, and um, for those who haven't seen it and are interested, uh, Marge and some of her urban colleagues have written a really terrific play paper about uh, place-based, place-conscious strategies and the tension between uh, moving to opportunity and place. Um, do you want to share any thoughts about that? Well, I, I, I've been arguing for some time, really, coming to the same conclusion, uh, that we need to do both. The evidence argues 
uh, for a both and strategy. And um, in fact, I think that this debate about people versus place or uh, mobility versus revitalization is really a counterproductive argument uh, and that um, neither one of them can succeed fully mm -hmm. if the other part of the strategy is neglected. Uh, so I, I don't see how we cannot uh, invest in um, the most urgent needs of poor neighborhoods. Uh, and that means safety, it means schools, and it means healthy places to play. Um, so that the kids who are growing up in those neighborhoods can get a foothold on the ladder toward a, a decent life, a chance of success. And when those investments uh, work and when they start to pay off, then we have to worry about preserving affordable housing options in those now very attractive neighborhoods uh, in cities uh, so that uh, some of the original residents can stay and, and enjoy the benefits. Uh, but I think at the same time that we pursue that strategy, we absolutely have to be eliminating the barriers that still block lower income families, um, especially families of color, uh, from finding affordable places to live uh, in neighborhoods of their choice uh, that already have good schools and safe playgrounds uh, uh, and uh, uh, healthy grocery store options. Um, so that means doing just what was happening in this series uh, building um, low and moderately priced housing, building rental housing in neighborhoods all over the place, cities and suburbs, and using federal housing subsidies like vouchers, but our other subsidy mechanisms too, uh, to really help poor families who want to uh, make that kind of a move to opportunity. Um, so I, I, I am sometimes uh, accused of being naive and thinking uh, that we can and should do both, and I know resources are scarce. Uh, but if you start thinking about a portfolio of approaches in any given city or region that includes a combination of activities, they're going to add up to more uh, than um, individual battles between this mobility initiative and this revitalization effort. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and go back to this conversation about federal level and local level. Uh, tensions. Um, I noticed uh, a fleeting glance of uh, Secretary Kemp being hung in effigy mm -hmm. during one of the community protests. Um, <laughs> that there were uh, federal officials in the form of Judge Sands uh, were um, in many ways perceived of as the enemy of the community. That the local officials, your job was to protect us against those national um, what is, uh, uh, Council Member Splone calls them, you know, the others who, who fail to protect our wimps. And in the series, we see those council members per seeing personal fines, some of them threatened with jail for their uh, voting against it. So, uh, you know, in some ways, the federal officials are seen from a local perspective as the bad guys. Um, uh, from the local perspective, the, uh, the, the local officials are good guys, but in our national debate, in the stories on the New York Times, there's a New York Times reporter who becomes a bit of an um, uh, adversary to one of the opponents of the housing. Um, the local officials are the bad guys. Um, uh, David, you want to talk a little bit about the role of federal and state, and then maybe Mr. Mayor? Maybe, uh, Secretary? Uh, <laughs> Mayor, Secretary. <laughs> Promoted or demoted. <laughs> <laughs> That's still the best uh, title. Mayor still the best I agree title. with you. Um, uh, I mean, I think it's sort of ironic that, that, that Jack Kemp became the enemy of, because the, uh, this, the case came out of the Carter administration's uh, Civil Rights Division, and of course, for the, the, the subsequent eight years, it, that division was completely morbid. I mean, this, it was a residual case that was pursued because it got launched before the change in administration. But uh, Secretary Kemp actually uh, kept good lines of communication open to try to help Yonkers get through this. He, he actually was, you know, in, 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 a, in a healthy bipartisan moment, he was trying to assist people locally who were trying to do the right thing in Yonkers, specifically the housing officials. Um, I was very impressed by not only Oscar Newman and his and his you know what he was able to achieve as a consultant, a court-sponsored consultant in the case in terms of the architecture and the logic, but the professionalism. You know, bureaucrat has a terrible. It's it's a phrase that we all sneer at, 
Um, but I was, I covered, I was on a metro desk of a newspaper in Baltimore for, for 12 years. I knew a lot of good bureaucrats who, you know, local, state people who knew their business. And very much so, the, the housing, the people that, if, when, when the politicians got out of the way and when the, mm. when the ranting stopped, there were people who were actually very effective at making pragmatic decisions that, that led to these houses, and not just the 200, but the 800 affordable that got built after them, functional and, 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 and not damaging the neighborhood and, and keeping promises. And, and um, it, it was a pleasure in some ways to, to honor, honor the, the cogs in the wheel because that's where the rubber hits the road. And, and, and if you look at federal housing policy, in the generations prior, the things that built in my city, Lexington Terrace and Murphy Homes and Flag House, you know, the big, enormous, disastrous, unpoliceable projects. I mean, I w in the 80s, I went into those stairwells to, to report stuff. And they were unpoliceable. And it was, they were, they were I mean, Oscar Newman was right on, on that score. And I've seen since the piece came out a critique of Oscar Newman saying, well, there are two things you can throw at the idea of defensible space and scattered site housing, one of which is it's not enough. It's not enough units. You know, you tear down these high rises. You know, you take down Cabrini Green or the Robert Taylor Homes. You, you start, and, and you're, you're, you're throwing only a handful of units by comparison back into the housing mix. You got to do more. You're going to have to invest in, in, in more units if, you're, if we're going to get rid of these things that were repositories for just entrenched poverty and where the kids grew up, you know, with, with clear, with, you know, it was less, li not just less life expectancy, but what kind of life were you expecting? Um, so th there is a valid critique of it's one thing to take down the old massive housing projects of the past and try to do scattered site and defensible space, but you got to do that w in meaningful numbers. Um, and the other thing that was a, a critique is I thought was, uh, of where the federal priorities have gone, I thought was really specious. And I read something, it was like, what, what show me a hero got wrong about housing policy. And, and they, what they were arguing was, if economic opportunity was available, if there was all kinds of jobs available, if, there were all, if, if the educational system were functional, living in high rise condensed projects would not be as significantly disastrous and dystopian as it is. You know. Again, anybody starts to get perfectly ideological on me. <laughs> I, I, you know, the libertarians, you know, it's all, uh, I hear, but the liberals too. I mean, on some level, no, I'm sorry. You know, those jobs are not coming back. They're not about to open all the factories that went to the Pacific Rim and Matamoros, Mexico. They're not gonna open them in West Baltimore again. You know, the port isn't coming back the way it did. Beth Steele is not gonna reopen tomorrow. This is the economic world we have now. So you're really talking about entrenched unemployment. You're talking about underemployment. What is the best housing function for that? And there, Oscar Newman really had it surrounded, which was you can't, you know, this level, in this kind of economic disparity, you know, you, you put up a 12-story unit, you put up six towers of that, I can tell you what's gonna happen. And having been a police reporter in Baltimore when those towers were still standing, he was right. So anybody starts getting pure on me ideologically and saying, oh, we, you just have to, you know, you just have to be, you, 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 you put your blinders on and just pretend that everyone's going to be great the moment we put up a high rise. No. You know, it's like somewhere in the middle doing something of everything or acknowledging the boundaries on both sides. Somewhere in the middle is, is what, what seems to me to be functional. I'm really into pragmatism. I'm not, I'm not particularly into ideology. So, Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. um, before I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that, but I also want to put one more topic on the table before we're going to come back to everyone. So I hope you're writing and getting your cards ready. Um, we're going to raise your hands and people will come around and start to collect those. Um, the other thing the story does really well is it talks about the relationship. I don't know, David, if you were thinking consciously of this or not about the relationship if you between like, I was, if you you like that I was thinking consciously <laughs> 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 about the relationship between housing and health um, and how we we talk now about housing as a platform we have uh, I love the story of of uh, the kid with asthma and, and the 
uh, the way that the, the mothers looked at the physical space for their children and, um, there, and the, the woman who was not well suited to live in the towers because of her diabetes had led to her blindness. Um, so I'd, either on the federal uh, relationship between federal and state and also if you wanted to see the echoes for today's conversation in health and housing. Yeah, well, just on that, on health and housing, I mean, we do see, and folks who do the research see, a very strong link between the two. And the fact is that HUD has been investing in this connection for a while, whether it's combating elevated blood lead levels uh, or uh, mold remediation or uh, issues related to asthma. Uh, these days, uh, we're excited about the work that's centering on this demographic, demographic wave of baby boomers who are becoming senior citizens and how do we get folks to understand that investing in housing with good supportive services and health care is a way to both ensure uh, healthier residents and probably uh, longer life outcomes and also save money on the other end of Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and so that's, we've only begun, I think, in federal policy to understand the power of that linkage. Um, with regard to the, this issue of federal and state, yeah, now I've seen it from both ends. And um, one of the things that, that does strike me is, of course, everybody knows that, that to the extent that you can get something to be led locally, that's always going to go over better in the local community than if they see the federal government. Outside of, you know, I think some, some progressive bastions in some parts, of the, maybe in San Francisco they wouldn't care, but I, you know, <laughs> I, I came from Texas, so I had to deal with this issue, <laughs> as y'all might imagine. Getting the local community to buy in is always the best policy. And to the credit of the Obama administration, and you know, I'm here for the last two years, but I saw as mayor, one of the good things they were doing was establishing stronger relationships with mayors and with county officials than usual and engaging uh, local officials to work across these silos in the federal government, you know, housing, working with education, working with transportation, with EPA, getting local governments to, to mirror that uh, and then to work with the federal government. So I'm hopeful that even after this administration is, is complete in January of 2017, there are a whole bunch of mayors out there, county officials, city council members, that are gonna work in that way, and also that will have had a positive experience with the federal government that hopefully they'll carry on you know, when they work with the next administration and so forth. So uh, James, just quickly on this point, uh, your cases are very often brought against the local actors. Um, are the feds your friends in that work? Federal judges are, are al almost always uh, helpful and uh, yes almost all of our cases uh, are against uh, local government um, and um, you know HUD has been uh, at some points friendly and at some points um, not friendly to be frank and um, it uh, and, th and that has been both under Democratic and Republican administrations sometimes friendly sometimes not friendly and um, and, and I, I, I will um, s say to, to David's point that the the cogs in the wheel are perhaps the most important relationships that you can have because uh, the administrations and their viewpoints change, but, uh, but those bureaucrats don't change. And, and your relationships with those bureaucrats are so important and, and they make all the difference, frankly, in what your outcomes are in, in, um, in, your, uh, in, in, in everything that you're doing on a federal level. So all of, uh, I see in this room many people who are current federal employees and some maybe local as well. So I hope you can go home and tell your families that you were celebrated today uh, as I'll important. just really quickly amplify that point that, you know, people get caricatured as bureaucrats, but you know, David and James make a very good point that, that they're the ones that are supposed to be able to do this without the politics without the crowd that is on them and wanting to and thinking well am I going to get elected or not elected if I decide this or if I decide that you know that is the power uh, and I think the blessing of the bureaucracy um, as much as it gets maligned they have a great role to play in ensuring fairness and even even handedness so Marge one of our questioners uh, from the audience asked a question that picks up on something Marge talked about before so for all of you but Marge as well um, they, they were asking about the, the 
intersection with these issues and the thing that may be in healthy cities and cities that are growing right now as big a challenge for low income and, and, and also communities of color, for example, here in DC, which is the challenge of gentrification, of, of seeing that property values rise when a, when a neighborhood starts to grow, when there's a lot of economic investment and the people who were longstanding residents of that community can no longer to be part of it anymore. How do, the, how do those two issues relate to one another? And where, I hate to say which is the bigger challenge because every place is different and in some cities they have both those challenges simultaneously. How do you pursue them simultaneously? Well, again, I think part of, part of, the, part of what gets us into trouble is that we um, try to tackle, okay, what's my initiative for addressing this gentrification issue in this neighborhood today? Or what is my strategy for addressing this deeply distressed neighborhood uh, today? Um, and uh, th those neighborhoods are part of a larger metropolitan market that's changing all the time. People are moving around, uh, and neighborhoods are inevitably changing. And if you're focused on uh, giving uh, people at every income level the chance to make choices about uh, where they want to live and uh, to have choices of neighborhoods that are rich with opportunities, then you think about a portfolio of strategies, uh, including how are we revitalizing the most distressed neighborhood, making it safer, making it healthier? How are we building affordable housing and preserving affordable housing in the neighborhoods where the market is starting to take off and uh, prices and rents are getting hot? And at the same time, how do we take the pressure off uh, low-income families in both those circumstances by opening up and creating more affordable housing in neighborhoods where it currently doesn't exist? So again, um, this may sound a little utopian, but I really think each of those goals is easier to achieve if it's being pursued as a part of a strategy that includes all of them. Anyone else? One of the challenges, though, is that that does end up crossing political barriers, yes. right? That the, um, it's, you know, so you, you end up, a, a lot of times, uh, you spend a lot of your time fighting within the city, but then um, some of the ramifications or consequences really exist in the suburbs. And, um, and, and, and so it, it becomes a, a, a greater challenge trying to, when you realize that you've expended so many of your resources only in the city and that you've forgotten to, to fight these fights in the suburbs at the same time. My hope would be that's how that's one of the areas where the federal government can yeah, help. Yeah, um, that's true. The federal government creates some incentives and some pressures mm -hmm. uh, to overcome those local uh, yeah. political balkanization. Yeah. So I've got two questions here, and I'm going to ask them both, and then invite anyone to comment on either of them. The first is. Um, about the role of anchor institutions. This comes from Deborah Bailey at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance. And she's specifically asking about the role that universities and hospitals play in the effort to push, uh, to create more uh, affordable housing in our cities. Um, and the other question comes from Piper Hendricks at Habitat for Humanity. Um, and uh, she's asking, and in, in, in this comment I hear a, a sort of a plea <laughs> um, can we find more examples of success in addressing nimbyism and winning hearts and minds in favor of decent, affordable housing? Maybe anchor institutions could be examples of that, but maybe not. I can speak to uh, anchor institutions, uh, very specifically being from Baltimore and having done Treme in, in, in your city of New Orleans. Um, you know, I think that there's a real ugly tell in yeah. East Baltimore and in, in Mid-City with uh, the ambitions, uh, you, get a, you get a strong, powerful anchor institution that has its own particular ambitions, and something like affordable housing and the integrity of the surrounding neighborhoods is, if it's not even a secondary thought, it's, 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 it's completely vulnerable. Uh, in East Baltimore, uh, Johns Hopkins University, the most powerful institution, you know, and certainly the, the largest employer in the city of Baltimore after, after government, um, they destroyed the village in order to save it. I got, I got 12, 15, 18 square blocks of, of brown fields that uh, is gonna be graduate housing or a biotech park that has been slow to build, but you know, they got rid of it. They got rid of East Baltimore. They solved their problem with uh, integrating themselves to the surrounding community. And the same thing happened with, uh, with, the, with the hospital complex. That they looked upon Katrina 
as being an opportunity for them as an institution. Uh, and and uh, a lot of affordable housing and a lot of uh, tr uh, traditional neighborhoods uh, were bulldozed yep. in, in, in Mid-City. And you know, I, I think anyone who thinks that unpoliced these institutions are going to rate affordable housing or the integrity of communities to be of any value other than their own ambitions is very naive. Yeah, the, the, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm married to an academic, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and sh she's been at three universities since we've been together, uh, Princeton, uh, Tulane University in New Orleans, and now Wake Forest in, in North Carolina. And, uh, and uh, as much as uh, I guess uh, we're thankful that she's uh, been able to be employed, um, <laughs> The, um, uh, uh, the experience for the neighborhoods where those universities have been located, um, at least with regards to affordable housing, has been terrible. Uh, and um, and you know, what they do is they drive up property value without any regard for affordability or low-income families. And uh, oftentimes, uh, uh, particularly in New Orleans, Tulane University uh, was one of the, the, the greatest drivers of unaffordability. Secretary, you have an office that has, in, in the past at least, focused on trying to work with anchor institutions and make partnerships yeah. with the universities. Is there, do we have any positive stories yeah. to tell <laughs> <Piper about? laughs> Well, let me offer you a little bit of hope. <laughs> uh, a good example of this is the University of Chicago, and some of y'all may be familiar with the Woodlawn neighborhood there near the University of Chicago. She worked there too. Uh, they got a choice neighborhood grant, and they have worked uh, to, uh, support the redevelopment and enhancement of the Woodlawn neighborhood uh, in a number of ways uh, from helping with security in the area um, to uh, sharing of resources um, and uh, so there, there is one example of a university that has gone outside of its bounds uh, to try and be part of the, the solution um, but I think that Oftentimes, the, the problem for universities is that they just don't think about it. Uh, that's not part of what they see as their mission. And so anytime we can get, whether it's a university or a hospital or another anchor institution, to think in terms of what else they can do to, to help the folks who live around there and not to, be, uh, not to pursue policies or investments that have an exclusionary impact, basically, on their surrounding area. Uh, then I see that as a positive. Uh, I know in the 1990s, I remember reading the pamphlet under Secretary Cisneros that he put out, some of y'all may remember it, about the role of the university in neighborhoods. And whether it's building off of Hope Six, Choice Neighborhoods, they do have a role to play in positively impacting those, those neighborhoods around them. And the University of Chicago today is one example that we cite. So the other part of the question that we had was about uh either programs or efforts at affordable housing development that have, um, that have helped create more Marys, that have helped see people um, not only uh, sort of come to accept and almost not notice, but that have actually uh, changed hearts and minds. And I, we don't, unless anyone has anything they want to add, I just think we are, that the search for the Marys, I think, is one of the things that I take from this story that that was uh, other people have have criticized Newark because it was very expensive uh, per unit of housing that those those so those programs were and scaling them is is a huge challenge. Um, we have a question from Adrian Todman who is the director of the DC Housing Authority here and she asks um, uh, I think something that is uh, really interesting to think about. Um, uh, she she su says that many people in DC in particular actually do understand the need for affordable housing. When you use that term, many people see themselves in it. Um, and they see the idea that having a community where its workforce can live is attractive. Um, my words, not hers. Um, but that same support is not always there when we talk about public housing. Um, and uh, we have here with us uh, actually Joe Scholdener, who uh, t directs the uh, Housing Authority of the City of Yonkers today. Um, so the challenges of our public housing uh, uh, in this country and public attitudes about it, Mr. Secretary, if you want to share No thought. question, uh, still a stigma associated with traditional public housing, also with Section 8. Uh, you know, a few months ago when, when that video came out of the officer that manhandled that young woman, uh, was it in 
it was in one of the Dallas, the DFW area suburbs. Uh, and before, you know, they had told the kids, you know, go back to your Section 8. There's no question that, that our voucher uh, holders and our public housing residents still face a stigma. Um, I mean, how do you do, deal with that? Well, I do think that opportunities for reality testing for folks. Here we had one very crystallized example of it. I wish that I could say that that were more common because the fact is that you know, in most of our cities today, our, our, our localities, a lot of times people don't interact like that. Sometimes they do at work. Uh, sometimes they do in places like the subway, if you're on the T in Boston. Um, but there's not enough of that that happens. And what's, what's ironic is that um, when we talk about affordable housing versus public housing, the story of that is that those two things have become very blended over these last couple of decades. You know, you'll have, you'll have um, housing that is, is mixed income, that blends uh, people of different income levels. And so that, that, that stigma needs to be, I think, um, chipped away at, and people ought to rethink what they believe is just public housing, too. March? I would, I would add, I think there is a stigma there that um, stems from prejudice. Uh, but in addition, um, those uh, perceptions of what public housing is also connect back uh, to some of the realities of past public housing. Um, and um, I, so I think it makes it absolutely essential that these programs are administered really effectively. Uh, that public housing developments that exist need to be managed really, really well. And uh, local housing authorities need to manage the voucher program really effectively. Uh, so that those programs live up to their potential, serve their residents well, and don't um, feed uh, prejudices and stigma about what subsidized housing means. Uh, in New Orleans, we did a, uh, uh, a study of, uh, of why landlords wouldn't accept vouchers. We would uh, you know, have voucher holders to try to rent apartments in neighborhoods of opportunity. And, uh, and when they were turned down, then we would have them to ask the landlords why. And then we'd also uh, have researchers to call them and, and see if they could interview the, interview the landlords and see why they were turned down. And so we, 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 you know, we came up with this list of reasons. And one of the top reasons, interestingly enough, was the, was the management of the housing authority. Um, and, and people said, well, you know, I tried it before, and um, after I had my, my tenant in for three months, I never got a check. <laughs> and uh, so I ended up in this tough situation where I had to evict this tenant because uh, you know, my tenant couldn't afford the rent, and the, you know, it had been three months and I never got paid. And, uh, and, and my tenant was just fine. And that happened over and over and over and over and over again. And, and, so, um, and so as much as all the stereotypes came up, we got you know, lots of racial stereotypes and so forth, that was the number one reason was, the, was mismanagement by the housing authority. That's, that's a stereotype about New Orleans government. Oh, well. Which is, <laughs> <laughs> which is you know, so, as they say, a stereotype has its roots in, in a certain reality. I mean. A whole nother panel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> and not for this city. <laughs> right. <laughs> So I grew up in a, um, uh, uh, assisted housing in Sorry. Upper West Side in New York. I, was, I lived in a Mitchell-Ama project that was for middle class families. But we were in a neighborhood in which, and there were towers because it was Manhattan. I, we were, I li lived on the 25th floor. But uh, the building next to me was public housing. The building across the street was, um, and, uh, and down the block was, uh, also was public housing for the elderly and there were um, uh, moderate income assisted housing projects. And um, if you were a student of architecture, you could tell which buildings were under which programs because you recognized the way building doors were framed. For example, public housing always used certain types of materials and assisted housing used different others. But the fact was that, that it was a neighborhood that worked because it was mixed in with other kinds of housing very successfully and it had the anchors of Central Park West and Riverside Drive, which were always going to be upper middle income houses. And so that mixture. So I think that uh, the public housing didn't have the stigma in that neighborhood, maybe uniquely because of geography, that it has in some others. And I, don't, I know that's at a lower scale much of what your department's trying to do today. Um, so David, is, um, uh, a number of our questioners have um, 
uh, are really itching to do your job because what we have here are a whole lot of storylines that people are <laughs> suggesting. I suspect this isn't the first time this has ever happened You're to you. You're not getting more than six hours about public housing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Senator, we've got... We've moved on to tax reform. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, how about really the role exciting. of yeah. Yeah, well, earned income tax subject. credits in low-income families? Can we uh, talk about the impact of work requirements and public benefits? Or hear from uh, Margaret Pothig. She argued that given the recent visit of Pope Francis and his messages on poverty and immigration, uh, maybe your next series, she suggests, might be on the intersection of religion and politics and social policy. Um, so stepping back, uh, whether you want to tackle um, uh, religion and policy or not, um, <laughs> Uh, you, there's Religion not needs to be tackled. Tackled, okay. <laughs> well, so maybe we'll, we'll after Forcibly. after you do the House of Representatives. Um, but uh, wh what makes you know? You, we were talking before about the audience for this program. This has gotten extraordinarily wonderful reviews. Um, its audience is modest. People in this room and others like us, I'm sure. Um, what, how do you decide which of these issues make for compelling television, and what are you able to tackle and get support for? Um, you need a spine, uh, you need a narrative spine, which really has to do with character and, and, and story. So in this case, it's the political life and death of Nick Wasisko. Um, onto that, you can graft, that, onto that skeleton, you can hang all kinds of you know, organ and flesh and, and, and try to get as much in as you can. But, I think it's really, I, I, let's be honest, there are things that policy uh, research and even journalism, good journalism, can, can, you know, can accomplish that drama cannot. Um, drama is in some ways a provocation, uh, a, a means of getting an argument started, but exposition is the death of drama. And, and so as we noted, you know, th th this case began in 1980. We come in in 87. We're out uh, pretty much on the end of Nick Wasisko's uh, career. Um, and that's 94. The case went on to 2007. There was a desegregation component. There was an affordable housing component. Um, it was an incredibly complicated case. We're not tracking that. We're tracking, we're showing you a political career that runs up on the rocks of of America's inability to share. And we can make a very distinct allegory and we can, and we can use this to reflect on our time and on, on things that are, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously straining the MTO stuff that happened in my city. I'm looking at what happened post Katrina in New Orleans with housing. I'm looking at the fact that, you know, in Tarrytown, two, how, two towns north of Yonkers, same fight, same rhetoric. And I think to myself, I can use this and I can use this uh, life of, of, of Lucisco to tell a story that will trick people into considering the idea of, of public housing and of shared citizenship. But there's things I can't do and, and like nobody could have a conversation, none of the characters could have a conversation where they explained fully mm -hmm. uh, the origins of public housing. Mm -hmm. The idea that this was a program uh, it goes back to the, to the New Deal in fact in, in, its, in its origins and that it was originally for white people. Um, in fact, you know, by and large, it, w it was in it right until the end of World War II when it became an incredible resource for returning veterans and their families. Um, and that the, the, the hyperbolic opposition to it now uh, has its origins in the fact that people of color be began to become the beneficiaries of it. Um, if somebody, if a character just said what I just said to you, it's a room, it's like, man, <laughs> no, they can't write. I, I'm, I'm going to Game of Thrones. You know, I mean, I mean, in some ways, you have to understand what it can and can't do, and you have to, um, you have to, you have to let drama be drama. So it can be a provo provocation, but a lot of people, because I come out of journalism, a lot of people always ask me the question: Well, is this supplanting what you used to do with news? No, you know, journalism was journalism. And it's, it's a shame people are inured to it or that it's not being done on the same level anymore because the revenue stream in journalism has been so impaired. But it had its own, its boundaries for what conceivably be accomplished by a careful reporter or a careful researcher 
uh, or research being reported and discussed, that I can't replace that with this. I can, I can be a provocation and I can begin an argument, that's it. And, and, and so I gotta be really careful about claiming more for this than I can. Well, but, but let us say that um, what it can do is it can cause all of us um, who might sometimes get caught up in our day-to-day -day lives and who may uh, almost turn away um, when you go home to relax, to find another way to engage and really think. Um, and I do think there's no doubt that these five or six different storylines we've been talking about have this common thread and you've told that tale in a really wonderful way that, that brings new insight. And it's a, just as the researchers bring, we believe we bring research to the table, uh, obviously, um, insight to the table, this is clear that there's great, great insight here. And so I'm gonna ask each of you to, to offer a closing thought. Um, and, and I'm gonna uh, go back to the title of the show for the closing thought. Um, the, uh, you mentioned, I guess, um, earlier that, uh, that the title of the show comes from a line from F. Scott Fitzgerald, which says, show me a hero and I'll write you a tragedy. And there's a great video clip if you watch um, the shows on HBO, they do a little interview uh, with about the making of the show afterwards, which is well worth watching. And you talk a little bit more in that, David, about what that quote means. Um, you know, the mayor was not really, or certainly not a, a, a perfect hero, but his life uh, certainly ends tragically. So I'm gonna ask you to reflect on whether you think our nation's struggle to find a way for people to live together in healthy, integrated communities of opportunity, is that um, gonna end tragically or, or do we have, do we end with some hope that we're, we're making progress um, uh, on that question? Marge, do you wanna start us, we'll go. Well, um, Sarah knows that um, I'm an optimistic person by nature. <laughs> uh, so Chronically, <laughs> pathologically <laughs> so. <laughs> um, I, I can't accept uh, that it ends as a tragedy. I can't accept that um, uh, the segregation that, that we have built in our country is insurmountable. Um, I, I, I recognize, um, for one, how painfully slow the progress has been uh, and how incredibly difficult uh, this issue is uh, for uh, people with political responsibility and power uh, to, tackle, to tackle honestly. One of the things that makes me optimistic right now is that there is a huge amount of concern about inequality and barriers to mobility in our country. And those topics are uh, in the news and getting a lot of attention from a much wider range of people than are typically talking about segregation and its consequences. But Raj Chetty's research, uh, this series, uh, other um, issues in the news push the topic of segregation, the challenges of segregation, up into the conversation about inequality and mobility. Um, and I think if we can keep it there, if we can make it clear that we're not going to narrow uh, these widening equity gaps, we're not going to overcome the barriers to mobility up in our society if we leave ourselves as segregated as we are now along lines of race and ethnicity and money. Uh, I think if we push those conversations together, we might be able to accelerate the pace of progress. James? Uh, well, well, first of all, I want to thank David for telling uh, not just this story, but also the, uh, the Treme story, uh, which you know, I, I know you've heard it a hundred times in New Orleans, but it, it just um, was so realistic and, 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 and truly told the story of New Orleans after Katrina. Uh, and you know, the, the one other point that I think uh, may sound funny, but it's so true, is that whenever people tell uh, a New Orleans story on television, the, uh, the accents are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so, but somehow when I watched uh, Treme, it, it sounded, unfortunately, it didn't sound like me because my, my New Orleans accent is uh, bad. So um, <laughs> um, the, the, the other thing I wanted to, to say, um, but before I get specifically to the question, is um, is that when it comes to the, so, so, so my friends who were watching, um, who started watching, frankly, before I began watching, all told me uh, that I had to tune in to show me a hero right away because, um, because they, they saw me in the show. Uh, and, and they saw me in the show both because of the housing advocacy, but also because, and I don't know if you knew this or not, but in 2010, I, I ran for mayor of, of the city of New Orleans. And, um, 
And so, you know, it was a, a very tough and difficult campaign. And one of the things that I didn't know at the time was that uh, the, the housing lobby in the state and the city was uh, apparently throwing hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, uh, in the campaign against me in order to keep me from being successful. Which I, I and at the time I was like, well, who's doing this? I didn't know, I, I didn't know where all these negative ads were coming from. All my, the, you know, the folks I was running against, they're like, it's not me. I, I promise I'm not doing it. And so uh, I, I, I do wear it now as a badge of honor. At the time when you know my character was being assassinated, I was like, who's doing that? But so, um, so. So when I, when I saw uh, Nick going through all uh, the, the difficulties, particularly losing campaigns, uh, you know, I, I, I really identified with him. And, um, and, and, and when I agreed to come on this, uh, on this panel, it was before I saw the last episode. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so by comparison, it's ended well. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so far, give it time. Um, but so the, um, so but, but then last but, but not least, um, you know, uh, uh, this last question brings me back to the first question that, that you asked, which was, you know, how, how are things different? And so, you know, the, 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 the Yonkers case took 27 years. Uh, our case in St. Bernard Parish, which so closely tracks the, the Yonkers case, took about nine years. Uh, and so um, everything about the, the St. Bernard Parish case is so similar, but for the fact that we did it in about a third of the time. And um, over and over again, I keep seeing fair housing cases that are very, very similar and that are very complex and very difficult, um, but they get resolved in a shorter period of time. And so w one of the things that I think is, um, is, is um, clearly that is improved is that, um, is that we are resolving these issues um, in, in the court system more quickly. The second is, is that um, I, I do think that younger generations clearly see a benefit to diverse communities, and, and, and that younger generations of, of all uh, races and backgrounds um, want uh, diverse, inclusive communities. And so, it kinda, I, I, I do think that um, you know our goal as fair housing advocates is to put ourselves out of business. It, it may be that it's not our litigation that puts us out of business, but it is that young people put us out of business, um, and, um, just because they want something different. And, uh, and so what may be different uh, may not be our advocacy and it may not be the speed of justice, but it may simply be that young people think that diversity is good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was, I was going there too. I was, going, I was just thinking of my son who's college age now and the temperament that he has for being able to walk in a room and be, you know, be a white kid and be in a minority uh, in the room. Um, he grew up in Baltimore, and, and he's, he's a musician, and he's, he's you know, lived a lot of his life in New Orleans. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm a lefty. I came out from Montgomery County, but I don't have the same temperament that he does. And, I, and they made me a reporter in a majority black city, so I had to walk in the room and, and be in the minority. But I can remember feeling my own personal limitations. And my son and, and people of his generation that I've encountered there is, there's something transformational. Listen, I didn't think I was gonna live long enough to see an African-American president. That's, that was a remarkable moment in my life. So I, I think in some ways, the, the country's changing demographically. And one of the things that, when a lot of people were talking about what happened to Yonkers after the housing, a lot of people were citing the fact that, oh, well, you know, it was 80-20, 80% white, when, and now it's 55-45. But look at the actual demographics of the New York metropolitan area. It's supposed to be 50. Yeah, the victory is not keeping it 80-20. The victory is not destabilizing it while, while we become a country that is uh, a more of color than it, than it was, because that's where we're going. And in some ways, the demographics are going to outpace. You know, the future is going to belong to people who can walk in the room, and there's, there's no majority. There, there's pluralities. That's all there are. That's, who, that's, who get, that's who's going to claim the future. And in some ways, um, they're going to do it whether we like it or not. And, and some, of us, some of us genuinely like it. So uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I, that's probably the most optimistic you'll ever catch me being. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm the, well, we heard I'm, it here. I'm the dystopian guy. But the other thing is, I, I would add just one thing to that, which is to say, um, it doesn't matter whether you're optimistic or pessimistic. Um, years ago, uh, somebody gave me a copy of, uh, of uh, Camus' uh, Resistance, Rebellion, and Death, the, the Myth of Sisyphus. And, and what he basically argues there is, okay, the odds are long, 
any number of things can go wrong. They probably will. You're going to lose, probably. You're going to lose more than you're going to win. It's going to be miserable. And, the, and, and death is at the end of every door. <laughs> you know? It does, you still, you know, only, you know, you can try or not try, but only one choice offers the chance at dignity, which is to fight. You either fight or you don't fight. You know, if you don't fight, you know, you're not only going to lose, but you're also going to be an asshole. So, <laughs> you might as well fight. I mean, it, it, in, in a way, right? It's the simplest thing to say. And, like, once you get, once you sort of unburden yourself of the need to, to win or to be assured of, of winning, then it, it even gets easier. You know, uh, I don't have many heroes left, but uh, um, <laughs> Izzy Stone, I have Stone, said the only fights worth losing sometimes are the ones, or the only fights worth winning are the only one, the ones you know you're going to lose. And if you think about it, sometimes that's, that's the way it's got to be. So it doesn't matter either way. So we've bookended our pessimistic uh, optimist I, I, with I, optimistic optimist. I want to see the HUD secretary. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see the I want to see you, you go so you dark. You pessimistic. <laughs> 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 it's not, he couldn't do it if he tried. Yeah, you get a call from the president tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> you're out of a job. Uh, no, I mean, I think. Everyone has said it very well. Um, first of all, thank you again, and to the Urban Thanks Institute. Congratulations on great work. Um, I'm very optimistic for many of the same reasons. Um, you know, the fastest growing uh, category, so to speak, in the census is people who are mixed race or identify as mixed race. Uh, you have demography changing in our country, and literally on that level, uh, you know, love overcoming prejudice, and I think of 100 years from now, what those kids are going to think when they, when they see what happened or read what happened uh, in terms of this kind of discrimination and efforts to keep people out. Now, it shouldn't take 100 years, and so that's where the fight comes in, and all of us have a role to play, and you know, for the fleeting amount of time that I and many of the folks in the room are at HUD, uh, we want to put up that fight, and part of what makes me optimistic is I know that there are a whole bunch of people out there uh, in different walks of life, but also in important leadership positions in local communities that also want to put up that fight, and we look forward to working with them to make that difference. Please join me in thanking us. Amazing discussion. Thank you, guys. Terrific. Very well done.